Live from WTVO Rockford and your home team, Eyewitness News at 5 starts now. Stateline families come together to remember their children. One mother says it's an unfortunate bond. Fall is officially here, which, which means it's flu season. When doctors weigh in on the best time to get the vaccine. Plus, racers came out to the Boone County Fairgrounds today. All the fun that was had on four wheels. Good evening, I'm Taylor Castro. Thanks for joining us tonight. Two people were killed in a car crash in Lee County on Saturday. It happened at the intersection of La Molin Road and Maytown Road around, 4 p around 3 p.m. Police say two vehicles collided. One was driven by 27-year-old Dane Mormon. The other was driven by 72-year-old Bonnie Ackert. Both drivers died from their injuries. Victoria Mormon was taken to the hospital. The crash is under investigation. An 18-year-old died Saturday from injuries sustained in a car crash. In early September, Oswaldo Leon Victoria was driving on North Winnebago Street when he reached the intersection at West Jefferson Street. Two cars entered the intersection and collided with his vehicle. Leon Victoria was taken to the hospital. He died on Saturday despite all medical treatment. According to the Winnebago County Coroner, Leon Victoria died from blunt trauma of the head, chest, and abdomen. A Sycamore woman was arrested Sunday for domestic battery. DeKalb County deputies were called to a house on Five Points Road around 3.30 a.m. They met with the victim, Tyler Scott, who had a black eye and scratches around his neck. Scott said that 24-year-old Kelsey Body had restricted his breathing while her hand was around his throat. Body was arrested on two counts of domestic battery and one count of aggravated domestic battery. She's being held in the DeKalb County Jail. Here at Eyewitness News, we are committed to supporting survivors of sexual and domestic violence. There is help out there for anyone who may need it. You can find a list of resources on our website. Just click on the State Line Strong tab. Today, for the 33rd year, organizers held a Walk to Remember. It gives grieving families that have experienced an infant death a chance to remember and honor their children. Amory Wilder talked to a mom who says it doesn't get any easier. Amory, how many people walked for this cause? Taylor, organizers say about 150 people usually come out every year. Infant mortality is the death of an infant before his or her, his or her first birthday. Last year, the rate in the U.S. was 5.4 deaths per 1,000 live births. I'm here because I lost Rylan, um, our daughter. Um, she was two days old when she passed away. Janessa Gravenstein and her family showed up in matching shirts on Sunday to take a stroll along the Rock River for a walk to remember. For Gravenstein, the experience of losing a child was devastating. She says she's not sure how her daughter passed. Did not expect to lose Rylan. We went in the hospital knowing that we were going to have a baby, and we came home with nothing. We came home with not having a baby. Fitzgerald Funeral Home is one of three sponsors for the event. Funeral director Melinda Hagerman believes this is a chance for families to get support, no matter how much time has passed. We have families that come every year that say, my baby was buried, there's not even a marker. Our society doesn't do a real good job with infant death. Uh, we kind of tend to sweep it under the rug. So th this is an opportunity for them to get together and, and share that, share those feelings. Gravenstein urges expecting mothers to be fully aware about what's going on with their pregnancy because it might make the difference in life or death. She says it's an unfortunate thing to bond over, but it helps knowing she's not alone. It feels good. It feels, you know, we all share the similar, um, we, we all share the same thing. We all share the same loss. We all share empty arms. We all, we all can share the same we all share the same thing. We all share the same heartbroken. The group walked about a mile, ending near Auburn Street Bridge. Hagerman tells me they have dedicated a couple of park benches, trees, and now a brick walkway engraved with infant names so families can have a place to go and remember. Taylor. Thanks, Amory. Now that we're officially in fall, you may start to see more signs and alerts about getting a flu vaccine. Health leaders are weighing in on the best time to get the shot. The short answer, it varies. Health officials say every influenza season is different depending on when it peaks and what the dominant strain of the virus is at that time. 
but leaders with OSF Healthcare suggested using the month of October to make a decision. They say the flu vaccine is a good tool to stay healthy, but those with underlying health conditions should make it a priority. For the most part, when we see somebody that comes in with flu, uh, we're looking at a patient that's older, that we're concerned about the complications of the flu developing into pneumonia or other serious illness. He says once you get the flu vaccine, you have some level of immune system response fairly quickly, but it takes a few days for you to build up a more robust immunity. Taxpayers in Arlington Heights may be overruled when it comes to footing the bill for an NFL stadium. The Chicago Tribune reports that residents have enough signatures for a petition to prohibit tax money from going to a new Baird stadium. But the village board is expected to reject it during its Monday meeting. The Bears have a preliminary agreement to buy Arlington International Racecourse for $197 million, but they want taxpayer help developing the land that would surround the stadium. Riders came out to the Boone County Fairgrounds today. It was for the Prairie Riders Snowmobile Club of Boone County's annual Grass Drags and Swap Meet. The club has been in the state line for 47 years. This is their 27th time holding the event. Four wheelers and snowmobilers were racing on the fairgrounds. We had a huge turnout today, so the weather had a big impact in it, and I think a lot of people are starting to you know, get back into doing some of this racing. I think the sport has been declining because we don't get the snow we used to. Uh, some of the prices of what it takes to uh, find snow and to uh, do this sport uh, has gotten a lot more expensive. The organization supplies Boone County snowmobile trail system with signage, clearing, and grooming. They're also the controlled parking organization at the main entrances of the Boone County Fair. After Hurricane Ian tore through southwest Florida last week, there is cleanup and a desperate search for survivors. President Biden is scheduled to travel to the disaster zone on Wednesday as the death toll continues to rise. At least 79 confirmed deaths across the state and at least four more in North Carolina. Rena Roy has the latest from Naples. A race against the clock across southwest Florida. Fire and rescue teams combing areas hit hardest by Hurricane Ian, traversing dangerous floodwaters, searching for anyone who might be trapped. First responders and FEMA on the ground, but also regular citizens hoping to help. We decided to go in because the water level, level has been going up. Former Navy SEAL Brian Stern mobilizing his own crew with boats and tools to rescue people, including Betty Reynolds of Sanibel Island, who couldn't leave her flooded home. I didn't think it was bad at all until the water started coming in. It came up about four feet in the house. So um, I've been living upstairs. This high school in Fort Myers turned into a shelter. Satellite images showing Fort Myers Beach before the storm and now the destruction that remains in its wake. Fort Myers Beach no longer exists. I mean, it'll have to be rebuilt. It'll be something different. It was a slice of old Florida that uh, you can't recapture. Now I've lost everything. All, everything, my life savings, everything, my tools, everything. Long, snaking lines of cars waiting for essentials like food and water. This is going to be um, a long road to recovery, and there are a lot of people that are impacted. We would continue to bring in resources to meet the needs. President Biden will visit the area on Wednesday to survey the destruction himself. He is vowed to do whatever it takes to help this state recover. Rena Roy, ABC News, Naples, Florida. Now, your first worn weather forecast from Chief Meteorologist Candace King. Well, I hope you're able to go out and make the most of this weekend because we know nice weekends like this are numbered, especially the further we get in the year. Beautiful out there. Made it into the low 70s yesterday, upper 60s today. 68 our temperature in Rockford, 67 right now in Freeport, 65 in Monroe, and 66 down in Rochelle. We've had a little bit of a breeze kind of working in this afternoon from the northeast. Kept us pretty comfortable. It was a little chilly out there this morning, especially as we had some cloud cover work back in, but we've been able to clear out most of our skies. This will leave us mostly clear here.
here as we take a live look with our SkyTrack camera out in Freeport at the Park Hills Golf Course. That clear sky, something that will stay with us through the night tonight, which will allow that temperature once again to drop down into the 40s. So a little cold start tomorrow, but we warm up very similar here for tomorrow afternoon. It is the beginning of October, so let's look back to September. Average monthly temperature, when you look at both the high and low, 64.5 degrees, actually pretty close to where we should be for the month of September. We did have quite a bit of rain, though, that came down uh, 5.84 inches of precipitation during the month. That puts us at a 2-plus inch surplus uh, for the month of September. Looking to hold on, though, to that drier pattern as we go not only through tonight, but for the next several days and really throughout the week as well. A look ahead to October. We tend to see a big change during this month. Average high temperature, 69 degrees, so right on par here for it this afternoon. Once we get to the end of the month, that average high drops to 55, average low down to 37. 2.63 inches is what we typically average during the month. And yeah, we can even get some snow. I remember a couple Halloweens ago, we actually had some snow come down on Halloween. It was a record that day and for that month. No snow, no rain in the forecast. High pressure remains in control, really keeps us nice and dry as the remnants of Hurricane Ian continue to work out took along the east coast and eventually out up the northeast. We've got our next storm system, though. This is an area of low pressure, a little counterclockwise spin moving across the Rockies. That'll actually help bring our temperatures down here as we go not only towards the middle of this week, but really here by the end of the week. So let's talk about tonight because we see those numbers, feel those numbers drop down into the 40s, low 40s when you wake up tomorrow morning. Wind for the most part should be light. Now we are really dry in our atmosphere, but there may be some areas of some ground fog early tomorrow. Nothing that I think will be too dense with some sunshine for much of the afternoon. Temperatures tomorrow very similar to what we had today. Winds a little light from the southeast. This could help some locations get up close to that 70 degree mark. We'll drop back down as high pressure centers once again overhead for tomorrow night. Back down into the low 40s, light wind. We're back into the low 70s for Tuesday afternoon. Lots of sunshine uh, for our Tuesday. Very comfortable. Back down into the 40s once we get into Tuesday night. Wednesday, we are looking mostly dry. Little increase in cloud cover as we've got a pattern change that'll be working in. So 43, that's where we head for the overnight tonight. May see a little patchy fog tomorrow. Pretty comfortable for the afternoon. High temperature close to that 70 degree mark. This is how it looks for the next seven days. We warm to 72 on Tuesday, 71 on Wednesday. Thursday is our transition transition day. I think high temperature officially in the 60s on Thursday. But Taylor, we've got a strong cold front that comes in. Look what it does to these numbers by the end of the week. Drops us down into the 50s for highs. And I think we could have our first freeze Friday night into Saturday. Now sports with Reagan Holgate. A lot of crazy football happening on this NFL Sunday. We'll start with the Bears and their quest against the Giants. One of these teams would end the day at 3-1. and one. First quarter, New York was trailing by three. Daniel Jones fools the Bears' defense on the bootleg, and he has room to run quite a bit, and he'll take it in himself. 21 yards for the score. Giants on top, 7-3. to three. Second quarter, Giants driving up 7-6. to six. Jones dumps it off to Saquon Barkley. He reverses on the screen, and he'll get the first down. Two plays later, Jones has room to run again, and, well, he's going to take this one in himself pretty easily. Giants up 14-6. to six. Here in the third now, Jones off the play action, but Jaquan Brisker immediately all over it. Nice sack there from the rookie. Three seconds left. Last chance for the Bears down eight. Justin Fields to Khalil Herbert. He laterals. Ball is still loose. It's Fields again now with it to Equi Equinemius St. Brown. I mean, this goes on for a while. You, you get the point. Gi Giants, Dane Belton will eventually fall on the ball, and that will be it. Giants will take this one 20-12. The Bears will drop to 2-2 two two after this loss. You know, it's 14-9 at halftime, half and when, you know, other teams scores touchdowns and we kick field goals. Typically, that's not good. So we got to make sure we uh, handle that in terms of our, our uh, scoring efficiency in, on offense in the red zone as well. So to turn some of those threes into sevens, and that's going to be uh, big going forward. You know, I think the main thing was just execution. Um, you know, of course, every you know, red zone uh, drive was different, but uh, you know, I felt like we did a good job driving the ball, getting to the red zone, but 
you know, I think we just got to capitalize and get down there. James Robinson and the Jags were in Philadelphia to take on an undefeated Eagles team. We didn't see much from the star running back today, though. He rushed for 29 yards on eight carries. The Eagles advanced to 4-0 with a 29-21 win. And how about some overseas action? The Vikings and Saints got this Sunday started for us in London, and what a game this was. Let's go to the fourth quarter. Justin Jefferson takes the handoff, and, well, he'll just walk it in. Vikings lead 25-22 to after a missed extra point. Under two minutes left, game tied at 25. Kirk Cousins takes a shot deep to Jefferson, and he's got it. That puts them within field goal range, and they'll get it 28-25 to now. Saints will get another shot, though. Andy Dalton goes deep for Chris Olave, 32 yards and just on the edge of field goal range. But Will Lutz is going to give it a shot, 61 yards. He made a 59-yarder earlier. His kick is on the way. It's tracking, it's tracking, but no, it's off the upright. And it's not just one, but it's a double doink. He pinballs it, and I mean it just hurts the more you watch it. That will end there at 28-25, and that's going to be a long flight home for Minnesota. Just needed a little gust of wind, and that, would ha that one would have gone into OT. And take a look at that Seahawks-Lions score. Highest scoring game of this NL season, NFL season by far, but the Lions just couldn't finish it at Ford Field. 48-45, the final. Lions move to 1-3. The Packers are in action at Lambeau with the Patriots. It was another first half of offensive struggles for Aaron Rodgers, but Robert Tanyan just caught one deep to take the lead 14-10.